Hello everyone, I am Sammy, your devoted manga otaku, and welcome to my manga space. Now, before we jump into this wrap-up, I wanted to acknowledge that I've recently gained some new subscribers, so I just wanted to say hi, <laughs> and thank you for subscribing and supporting my manga addiction. <laughs> On this channel, you'll find manga hauls, shopping vlogs, and various other videos where I share my thoughts on manga. For those that are new, this is my monthly manga wrap-up video where I share my spoiler-free thoughts about everything I've read in the month. March was a fairly average reading month for me. I wasn't able to read everything on my TBR, mostly because I was super focused on releasing my manga collection videos, which if you haven't seen, you should totally consider checking out. I'll leave a card on this screen and <laughs> link in the description. However, I did find some time to taste test a couple new series, as well as some highly anticipated manga, and out of everything that I read, I have some pretty positive things to say. I'll be reviewing the manga I liked the least this month first, and then I'll work my way up to my 5 star reads. If you'd like to hear a specific review, feel free to use the timestamps to jump around. And with that, I invite you to grab a coffee or other beverage of your choice, and let's talk manga. I want to talk about is volumes 1 through 3 of the Yen Press series, Golden Japanesque, A Splendid Yokohama Romance by Kaho Miyasaka. This shoujo series is set in Meiji era Japan and follows a 16 year old girl named Maria. Unlike most people around her, Maria has pale hair and blue eyes, which are features she inherited from her western father who left overseas when Maria was little. After being ridiculed and harassed for her appearance, Maria is forced to dye her hair black and keep her head down in order to avoid eye contact with other people. However, after Rintaro, the son of a wealthy family, discovers her secret and to her surprise is captivated by her appearance, Maria begins to gain confidence within herself. I started collecting this series last year because I thought that the volume covers looked very beautiful and the premise sounded intriguing. It gave me Cinderella meets Ugly Duckling vibes. I ended up really liking the first two volumes and I thought parts of the third volume were good as well. You can see the romance blossoming between the lead characters. Their relationship does move fairly fast, but I feel like that's not out of the norm for a historical romance. I half expected this series to be a little spicy because it's rated 16 plus, but I don't think I've seen anything that warrants that rating up to this point. It could be rated this high because of verbal bullying, but I'm not too sure. <laughs> I was a little disappointed to see another love interest introduced in volume 3. If you've watched my content before, you know I'm not a huge fan of love triangles, and my first impression of this other love interest is that they're super annoying, so it's not great. <laughs> One thing I did like about the ending of this volume, though, was that it alludes to there being a two-year time jump between volumes 3 and 4, which sounds really fun. It means the characters will hopefully be more mature and grown up, which I'm totally excited for. Speaking of characters, I thought the leads were fairly fleshed out and interesting. Maria is a sweet and smart girl, but the belittling she receives from from everyone, including her own mother, molds her into this timid girl who's constantly second-guessing herself. We sort of get a taste of Maria breaking this mold in these volumes, but I'm hoping we get to see her continue to be bold, build up her self-esteem, and learn to love herself. 
As for Rentaro, he's mischievous and kind of a tease, but once he understands what Maria is going through and that he might have feelings for her, he takes things more seriously, which I appreciate. He also does a wonderful job of encouraging Maria without doing all the work for her. She still has opportunities where she can stand up for herself without him coming to the rescue. One character I really disliked in the series was Maria's mother. She says some pretty nasty things to Maria and is always desperate to keep Maria's hair and eyes hidden for fear of being ostracized for having a child out of wedlock with a foreigner. I'm curious to learn more about Maria's father and the relationship between her parents because we still don't know much even by the end of volume 3. When it comes to the illustrations, I think they looked great. I especially love seeing Maria show off her blonde hair and I loved the ballroom scenes in the second volume. They were very pretty. Overall, I think this series is good, but I also feel like it's very average. There isn't really anything special about it. However, I do think that it has the potential to be unique. It all depends on how the time jump and love triangle are handled. I'm going to give this series three and a half stars. I will be buying the next volume and I'm hopeful that it'll throw a twist or something unpredictable into the mix. The second series I want to talk about today is volumes one through three of the shonen comedy Mashal, Magic, and Muscles by Hajime Komoto. I don't have a whole lot of shonen series in my collection. It's not something that I usually gravitate to, but after seeing Manga Sloth's review on this series and seeing people in my comment section recommend this manga, I decided to give it a try and I'm really happy I did. The story of this Viz Media publication takes place in a world where everyone has the capacity to use magic. However, if you were unfortunate enough to be born magicless, the government will have you executed. Our main character, Mash, was born with this ailment. He has no magical talents, but what he lacks, he makes up for in muscles. <laughs> Mash's adopted father found him abandoned as a baby and raised the boy away from all civilization in a desperate attempt to keep his son's secret. He encouraged Mash to participate in strict workout routines in order to offset his inability to use magic and become an epitome of strength. Unfortunately, Mash has one known weakness, cream puffs. And after a bizarre turn of events, his secret is discovered. In order to save himself and his father from a terrible fate, Mash is forced to infiltrate a prestigious magical academy, aka Hogwarts, and excel in all his classes without using magic. When I first heard about Mashal, one comparison that stood out to me was people comparing this series to Harry Potter. I also heard that it gives off One Punch Man and Black Clover, Black Clover vibes, but I haven't read those manga, so I can't really comment on that. What I will say though, is that this series is a blatant parody of Harry Potter. We have schoolhouses, mandrakes, a Dumbledore-esque headmaster, a wizarding sport that resembles Quidditch, and much, much more. But despite it having all these Harry Potter references, I do feel like it's unique enough to stand on its own. From start to finish, this manga is absolutely ridiculous and fun. I love watching MASH make new friends and problem solve his way out of magic dependent tasks with just the use of his muscles. I have to applaud Komoto Sensei for his creativeness when it comes to MASH faking magic. There were a couple times where I was unsure of how MASH would execute something, but he always figures out a way and it's usually hilarious. <laughs> when it comes to the comedy, at first I thought it might not be for me, I thought it might be too childish, but I was quickly mistaken. I was losing it at all the references and punchlines, plus the comedic timing in this series is awesome. I really like the characters too, I think they're a lot of fun, but my favorite is MASH, of course. <laughs> 
I just love his laid back, nonchalant personality. He always acts like he hasn't a care in the world, but he actually cares a lot. MASH has made quite a few friends at the Academy up to this point as well. Their personalities are all over the top and sometimes goofy, but that's what makes them funny and entertaining. MASH has also made some enemies in school, including the Magia or Magia Lupus, which are an elite group of students from the Lang House, aka Slytherin. <laughs> There seems to be a nice mixture of comical and sinister villains, and I like that they all have their own gimmick. I'm really looking forward to watching them in action against MASH and his friends. We get a taste of some cool mage battles at the end of Volume 3, but I want more. <laughs> Lastly, I think that the art in this series is simple, but matches the story perfectly. The facial expressions are really funny sometimes, and the battle scenes and action scenes are really well drawn. Also, the series is rated 13+, plus, so there isn't anything too gory or graphic. In conclusion, I really enjoyed this series. It's good for a laugh and isn't emotionally draining or overly complex. It's a great comfort read gag manga and I'm going to give the first three volumes four stars. I've already ordered volumes four and five and I'm really looking forward to reading them once they come in. And then we have volume two of Sailor Moon the Eternal Edition by Naoko Taka Uchi. I'm currently reading one volume of this classic shoujo series a month and I'm really adoring this magical girl adventure so far. In this volume, now that all the inner scouts have been awakened, they must band together to defeat the Dark Kingdom, which is headed by the evil Queen Metallia and Queen Beryl. This volume surprised me a little bit in that the tone is darker than in the last book, and I feel like things are being taken more seriously. I loved the conclusion of this story arc. I thought the action scenes were drawn beautifully, and the romance between Yusagi and Mamoru is endearing. I was a little disappointed that the Sailor Senshi didn't play a bigger role in this epic battle against evil. Sailor Venus gets some moments to shine, but I yearned for more. Also, I didn't read realize that the iconic moment that's in the OP of the 90s anime, I'll pop a picture on the screen so you know what I'm talking about. That doesn't happen in the manga. The senshi don't support Yusagi in this moment, instead it's Mamoru who appears behind Yusagi. I never thought I'd say this, but I like the 90s anime version of this particular scene better than the manga. <laughs> Now, my favorite part of this installment was when Yusagi, Mamoru, Luna, and the Sailor Senshi regain their memories and we come to understand what truly happened. So many questions are answered. Questions that I've had since I was a kid. We learn Queen Beryl's true motives and we learn more about her henchmen, which actually play a bigger role in the lore than I thought. So. That was super interesting. Readers discover how both the Earth and Moon Kingdoms fell and why the different characters were incarnated without their memories. Also, I didn't realize that there were some Romeo and Juliet elements to the romance. I can't imagine that was included in the 90s anime. <laughs> One thing I will say about this series, something I've come to learn, is that it's better not to ask questions and just enjoy the story for what it is. Too many times I tried to understand how the girls learn new powers without direction or receive new items and just know how to use them. At one point in this volume, Luna is just like, hey, let's go to the moon. And then they all go to the moon. <laughs> it's bizarre, but I realize things are simplified and easy to understand in order to cater to its target audience, which is understandable. The art is beautiful and glamorous, like always. Again, I want to share some of my favorite spreads with you guys. Absolutely freaking stunning. The art never fails to blow me away. It is so 
gorgeous. So gorgeous. And lastly, before I wrap things up, I want to mention the little cliffhanger at the end, which signifies the launch of the second story arc. We're introduced to the littlest character, Chibiusa, and she has a gun for some reason. <laughs> I'm really excited for what comes next in this series because I remember watching the reveal of Chibiusa's backstory on TV when I was a kid, and I recall just being shocked at the revelation. <laughs> so I'm really excited to relive that moment again. Overall, I'm giving this volume four stars and I'm very eager to keep reading more Sailor Moon. And then we have volume two of the Ghost Ship series. JK Haru is a sex worker in another world, story by Ko Hiratori and art by J. Tayumata. The first volume of this series surprised me in many ways. I originally thought this series was going to be a fun, spicy manga, and to some extent it is, but it's also extremely heartbreaking. The story revolves around a teenage girl named Haru, whose life is turned upside down when her boneheaded classmate Chiba gets them both killed. Instead of dying, both Haru and Chiba are isekai'd to a very sexist and misogynistic fantasy world. Chiba is lucky and receives all these special powers after his reincarnation, which help him become a successful adventurer, while Haru, who receives no special gifts or abilities, has to become a sex worker in a brothel in order to survive. This volume covers some pretty heavy situations. Both Haru and Shiba have a moment where they reminisce about their old lives, including their friends and family, and it's just a very depressing conversation. Also, there's a part in the book where Haru struggles with and endures abuse from a very vile and cruel customer. However, just like the first volume, the heavy sections of the book are balanced by some cheerful and entertaining moments. We get to see Haru interact with her friends some more, as well as the madame of the brothel, and she seems to be very kind and understanding. At the end of the volume, a new and mysterious character is introduced, and I'm curious what role they're going to be playing in the story. Overall, I thought this was a really good sequel to the first book. I still enjoy reading Haru's optimistic thoughts while she's enjoying her free time, or her inner commentary while she's entertaining customers. Part of her job is acting, so seeing what she's truly thinking versus what she's saying and doing can be really amusing. <laughs> this is basically a five-star series for me at this point, but it could easily dip depending on what happens next. I'll tell you right now, if Haru ends up accepting Chiba's Be My Slave offer, I will be lowering my rating. I do not like him, I think he is very gross. <laughs> also, it's kind of obvious but worth mentioning, this series is rated 18+. plus. It has soft core sex scenes and depicts acts of sexual, emotional, and physical abuse, so if that isn't your thing, I would pass on this. However, if you like dark and mature stories that feature uncomfortable topics, I think this would be worth checking out. Up next, we have Volume 4 of the ongoing series, Mint Chocolate by Mami Orikasa, and this romance story centers around a taboo relationship between step-siblings. The last time I talked about Mint Chocolate was in my September manga wrap-up. If you're interested in checking that out, I'll leave a card on the screen and link in the description. But in that review, I talked about how I was really excited that the romance was wrapping up, and in this volume, things get even more heated. The romance between Nanami and Kyohei is so sweet. I love watching them explore their relationship and discuss things openly with each other. I feel like both characters are experiencing some growth, especially Kyohei. He's beginning to soften, and we're starting to see some very wholesome and vulnerable sides to him. Vulnerable. That's a hard word for me. <laughs> 
Another comment I made in my last review was that I wasn't invested in any other aspects of the plot apart from the romance, but after this installment, those opinions have pretty much melted away. It's hard to explain without spoiling anything, but basically I was satisfied with how some of the ongoing conflicts were resolved and I thought that the antagonist's motives made a lot of sense. It's kind of like all the pieces of the puzzle fell into place and it just clicked. It felt good. I'm giving this volume in particular five stars. It's definitely the best volume so far. I truly thought I was going to have some issues with some of the story progression and the characters, but it all played out perfectly. I've already pre-ordered the next installment and I'm really looking forward to what happens next. And then we have a series that I took a little break from because it didn't fit my TBR theme for February, but in March, I once again immersed myself into the supernatural world of Queen's Quality by Kyosuke Motomi. And it's been a lot of fun. Essentially, this series follows a family of sweepers, and sweepers take it upon themselves to perform spiritual cleansings in people's minds. A sweeper named Q discovers that his mysterious classmate Fumi shows promise as a sweeper, and while training her, Q uncovers parts of her forgotten past. I ended up reading volumes 4 through 6 of this Viz Media series, and a lot of things happened. <laughs> it's starting to get harder to talk about this series without spoiling anything, so I apologize if I sound a little repetitive or vague, but essentially, volume 4 lays the groundwork for the climax, and by the end of volume 5, the first story arc in the series, or the second story arc if you're counting QQ Sweeper, comes to an end. I thought it was an amazing conclusion, packed with intense action scenes, unexpected twists and mysteries. Fumi ends up uncovering and resolving something crucial, which is surprisingly bittersweet. I thought it was going to take a lot longer for certain things to happen, but I'm not mad at the pacing. I like that you can feel the story moving forward. Also, I appreciate that there isn't a whole lot of filler in the series. Even in their downtime, the characters are continuing to grow and learn. I'm enjoying the romance between Q and Fumi. They are so cute together and are written in such a way that everything they do complements the other person. Their personalities and supernatural abilities play off of each other nicely and the chemistry between them is electric. I wish their romance would progress a teeny tiny bit faster, but there is an in-story explanation as to why it's burning so slowly, so I guess I have to be patient. Easier said than done. <laughs> now, with the start of a brand new arc in Volume 6, there is a huge information dump, plus there's a few new characters introduced. I found myself switching between pages to reread dialogue and names to try and sort everything out. It is a bit complicated, but I think I got there in the end. Don't get me wrong though, the lore is interesting and I love the world building in this series. I just struggle to get everything straight, which could totally just be a me thing. <laughs> From the cliffhanger in Volume 6, I get the feeling that the next couple volumes might focus on Kyutaro and his growth. Also, I think we're going to learn more about his backstory, including more information about his parents and the clans, which is exciting. The graphics in this series continue to be very beautiful and detailed. I love how dark and intense the illustrations become when something serious is happening, and I love how Motomi Sensei breaks up those moments with lighthearted drawings and humor. Queen's quality continues to teach valuable lessons about the importance of mental health, how recognizing, understanding, and embracing the darkest parts of yourself can make you stronger. It teaches you lessons about teamwork, supporting the people you love, and standing up for what you believe in. I'm going to give these volumes five stars. The action, the pining, the badass heroine, <laughs> it's all great stuff. 
I'm not sure why so many people sleep on this manga. It definitely deserves more recognition. The last manga I need to talk about in this wrap up is a pre-order that I haven't actually hauled yet. I was having a not so great day last week and my husband suggested I take a moment for myself. So I curled up in bed with a cup of coffee and read volume three of My Love Mix-Up written by Wataru Hinakure and illustrated by Aruka. I talked about the first two volumes of this Jojo series in my last wrap up video. I'll leave a card on the screen and link in the description if you're interested, but to summarize my thoughts on the series so far, I really adore it. In this volume, we follow our lead characters to a ski resort in Hokkaido for their school trip. Now, this may sound trivial, but I can't recall ever seeing a winter-themed school trip in a manga. And I've read a lot of manga. Usually the class trips take place in warm weather, the students go sightseeing or go camping, but I don't think I've ever seen a school trip take place at a ski resort. So I really welcome the new experience and the new scenery. I will admit that the tone of the trip was a little silly and a little bit unrealistic at times, but it was fun seeing everyone learn to ski and enjoy the snowy landscapes. There's plenty of comedy and heartwarming moments throughout this volume. The story is developing nicely and the characters are discovering new things about themselves and each other. I like watching the protagonists explore their feelings and identity and we end up getting some really touching conversations between Aoki and Ida and also between Hashimoto and Ada. Another thing I love about this series is the focus on friendship and just supporting your friends when they need you. The one small complaint that I have is that I wish Aoki would allow people to speak. He's very dramatic and jumps to conclusions a lot. He really needs to learn to listen. I'm hoping it's something he'll learn to overcome versus this just being part of his personality because learning to listen to people is important. It's good that Ida is a very calm and patient person. He ends up balancing out Aoki very well. <laughs> I really like Oruko Sensei's art style, it's really pretty, and I love the comedic expressions and faces they give to characters in certain situations. I saw some people complaining that they're too much, but I completely disagree. The visual comedy is amazing. I'm going to rate this volume 5 stars. I think the story and the characters are wholesome and adorable. Plus, it's the kind of story that makes you laugh even when you're sad. It felt like the volume was building towards something, and I can't wait to see what's in store for this lively cast. And with that, we have come to the end of my March wrap-up. Just a heads up, I'll probably end up combining my April and May wrap-ups together simply because I'm going on a little vacation this month to visit my bestie, Jordaline, and we have some shenanigans planned, so I probably won't be reading very much. Also, I need to focus on hauling some manga. I have at least two hauls worth of manga just sitting there, and a bunch of them are pre-orders that I really want to read. <laughs> I'm hoping I can release a haul before I leave. Fingers crossed. <laughs> If you're interested in watching more videos from me, you can check out my end card where I'll have links to my most recent videos. I hope you all have a magnificent day, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!